California Preservation Foundation recently awarded four projects that involved the architecture and planning firm Page and Turnbull. These included three completed and very distinct rehabilitations and the collaboration with the city of Sacramento to create that Metro's historic district plans. Joining us today to discuss historic preservation and adaptive reuse is Ruth Todd, who since 2006 has been Page and Turnbull's principal and president. Welcome to the weekly, Ruth. Hi, thanks. Appreciate being invited. Mm -hmm. Ruth, let's start with the basic question. Uh, how did your firm get into uh, uh, historic preservation in the first place? Okay, well, our firm was founded by a planner, an urban planner called Charles Hall Page, uh, who started out rescuing Victorian houses uh, from the path of urban renewal uh, through the Western Edition in San Francisco. Uh, and a few years later, one of the architectural historians there um, conducted a historic resources survey, the very first one of downtown San Francisco that is still referenced today um, and was the basis of the city's first downtown plan. Oh, uh, and then, uh, then a few years after that, Jay Turnbull uh, came on board to establish the architecture studio. And so um, those three events have set us up to be the firm that we still are almost 50 years later. Mm -hmm. While every project is unique, there are common, uh, I'm wondering if there are common challenges to historic preservation uh, that, that you've encountered. Oh, sure. Uh, there are common challenges. There's a lot of things about dealing with historic buildings, though, that we like because everything is very unique, but there are some commonalities. A lot of the common issues that we typically deal with are around balancing um, the preservation of historic features with the requirements of regular building codes and the higher costs associated with the restoration of some of those historic features. So we often see uh, the owners that want to replace original features, especially windows and doors um, with contemporary, um, more energy efficient um, elements uh, that don't exactly match the original units. And so typically we have to deal with reviewing agencies that don't want to see anything replaced with owners that do want to see things replaced. And so it's often a balancing act for us to either do the evaluation and help them balance or negotiate those needs. Does your firm um, often serve as the mediator in that, re in that regard? Yeah, we do a lot of sort of entitlements work in addition to the planning and architecture uh, component. And so we're often brought in by other architects or clients um, to help negotiate the historic preservation requirements uh, and approvals for buildings, especially in California because of the, the regulatory environment here. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we do our own work, but we also can assist um, other projects negotiating entitlements and approvals. Mm -hmm. Adaptive so. reuse has all of a sudden become the hot topic today because of partly because of the coronavirus and people are looking to make building something else. Yeah. <laughs> From a design standpoint, though, can you discuss for our audience uh, uh, how your firm works with clients to help them realize their vision? Oh, sure. Well, we use sort of the normal tools of architects, um, but sometimes providing, uh, sometimes dealing with existing buildings have give us better tools um, to help clients visualize what it is that they want to do with these buildings. So sometimes providing visualizations are easier because we can use photo simulations using existing imagery uh, to create, you know, new visions for the client. Um, so that we don't have to construct renderings from, from, from scratch. Um, we also, you know, because these buildings exist, the clients can walk into them and understand the opportunity for the scale and the spatial characteristics. So they're not having to imagine something that they can't, you know, at all see. Um, and then, you know, there's lots of, lots of different approaches to dealing with existing historic buildings and a lot of design approaches can, can vary. And so very early in the process, we use a lot, we put together, you know, a lot of mood boards or precedent Im imagery to get a sense from them about what would be the appropriate direction that they want us to head so that we can then narrow that range of options to, to work with them to accomplish their goals. Mm -hmm. And then recently we've been using scan, scan to BIM services um, so that we can get really pre precise as-built um, that allow us to um, 
develop very accurate design documentation. So that alleviates a lot of field work and potential change orders during construction. Mm -hmm. Let's switch gears here and talk a little bit about the projects that were honored. And uh, I'd like to start off with the Greek Theater in Los Angeles, which okay. for for our, our audience is a 90 year old building with a outdoor music venue that's uh, about 6,000 seats. Tell me what you did with it. Well, uh, we've been working there for a good while, I think since 2015, you know, it's one of the, the, the um, country's largest urban parks, and the Greek theater itself is on eight acres, um, so it's a very big music venue, but it has suffered from some deterioration over the years. Um, it has a very thin concrete roof and some really unusual um, Greek style green glazed tiles on top of that roof. Mm -hmm. And so we helped with the seismic strengthening of that, uh, which involved um, um, taking the tiles off, putting down a, a polymer on top of the concrete to strengthen, the, to provide better seismic strengthening. Uh, we put the tiles back and then we restored um, eight um, metal doors, entry gate doors, um, as well as um, dealing with, I think we put uh, the sign back together. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> How long did the project take? Uh, we started in 2015 and I think it just finished um, earlier this year. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. My favorite of the four is uh, the Livermore Railroad Depot. Uh, and yeah. uh, I just like the, it's just a look, a cool looking building, the way you, you changed right. it. Tell me a little bit about what that entailed. Okay, well, it's a real warm, fuzzy story too, because um, the Livermore Depot was one of the, um, the Southern Pacific Railway kits of parts depots. So it's, mm. there's only six, um, I think six remaining of that particular style. Uh, and it had been abandoned since 1973. And uh, the community had, it was a source of pride for the community. And so we basically, we picked it up, we moved it a mile um, and put it back down next to new railroad tracks, although these are light rail tracks. Mm. Uh, and it's now serving again as the ticket office for uh, you know, rail transportation. And there was a lot, there were historic features that we had to, um, preserve and rehabilitate, but we also inserted new energy efficient systems and um, made it, you know, a state of the art transit facility once again. Just out of curiosity, who was the client on that project? It was the city of Livermore it and was. the transit agency. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've actually written about buildings that have been moved from one place to another and how complicated it is. When yeah, you were yeah. talking about a building that was that old and, you know, maybe a little fragile, well, what, what did you need to do to kind of make sure that it didn't just fall apart? <laughs> right. Well, we, we get involved in um, developing protection specifications and drawings that then guide uh, typically house movers that come in yeah. and uh, just make it a, you know, a, a very rigid structure so that it can survive the the lift and the vibration as it gets set back down on new foundations. Mm -hmm. The third project is St. Joseph's Church in San Francisco, which had been vacant for more than nearly three decades. And it was right. converted into a space for the uh, the, the, the St. Joseph's Art Society. Uh, right. It's a beautiful building. Uh, tell me what, what that entailed. Okay, well, that was the um, uh, that one took a long time to pull together to make that project work. Uh, so as you mentioned, it was abandoned for um, 30 years after the Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, it was in a section of town that had um, suffered a lot of vandalism. Uh, and so the primary scope of work was to, to put a practically invisible seismic strengthening uh, project together where almost everything that um, for structural systems and the mechan mechanical systems, almost everything was inserted in an invisible way um, so that we could restore the volume of that church. Uh, and then also because there was such a high volume of the church, we inserted a mezzanine uh, and mm. also had to negotiate the historic preservation components in order for the client to get historic preservation tax credits and new market tax credits. So it's kind of an economic success, success story also. 
Was it still sanctified as a church when you were working on it? No, it had not. It had been desanctified, and all of the almost all of the stained glass windows had been sold by the church um, prior to the the owner coming in and rehabilitating the building. So there were rose windows, and so there were some very tall elements in the towers um, of stained glass, but the majority of the church windows were um, were not stained glass. What's on the mezzanine? Um, on the mezzanine, it are is currently uh, it's a space for art display and and gallery and some some limited occupancy and um, actually the toilets are up there. Yeah. There um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the last project that was honored was uh, the Sacramento Historic District plans and uh, right. and this this involved this was a little bit more complicated in terms of what it entailed. Tell tell our viewers about uh, about your involvement in that. Okay, well, this was a planning project that our architectural historians and urban planners um, sort of took ownership of, and the city of Sacramento had has uh, 32 designated historic districts in their the core part of the city, and 27 of those uh, were are in areas that are feeling development pressure. And the, the historic districts had been surveyed and designated a good long time ago. And there was a lot of, um, uh, there was a lot of information that needed to be updated. So Paige and Turnbull staff came in and did architectural resources surveys to determine what is still a contributor within those historic districts. And then we worked with the city to understand where the development pressures were and we, um, created um, district specific design guidelines to guide the, the changes to those historic buildings and to advise on how to insert new construction within those historic districts in a way that would maintain the architectural character of those neighborhoods. I understand that document's 430 pages. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, yeah. But the graphics are nice, and there's some white space, so it's it's pretty easy to read. Mm -hmm. Ruth, uh, we also set it oh, up so that each district has its own chapter, so mm -hmm. you don't have to read all hundred all four hundred and eighty three pages in order to get the content that you're interested to see the content that you're interested in. Mm. Ruth, my last question is about kind of the future of historic preservation and, and how you see this market niche for your company in terms of a growth potential, in terms of new ideas and that you might be able to use in, in all kinds of projects. Right. Um, well, we're actually pretty lucky that um, historic buildings are present across almost all building types. Uh, and so we don't get narrowed down. We get to, to deal with historic buildings um, in almost all of our client sectors. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's also good that as time passes, there's more opportunity for buildings to become historic and we get to work on those, you know, so they don't really go away. Um, and some of the trends that we do see are there's a lot of, um, we're doing more projects that are adaptive reuse um, of many types of buildings for multifamily housing, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, elderly housing, um, low income housing, the, that's a, a trend that we see. Certainly the, um, the intersection of sustainability and um, the reuse of these historic buildings to preserve um, embodied energy and uh, divert from, from landfill is much more understood uh, in terms of, of the synergy. And so we do feel that uh, merging the sustainability and resiliency movement with historic building preservation is becoming much more um, acceptable and, and understood rather than um, greenfield development. Well, Ruth, thanks for taking a couple of minutes today to share uh, your experiences and congratulations on the recognition for your projects. Thank you. I wish you good luck yeah. through the remainder of the year. Thank you, same to and, you. And uh, thanks to our audience for viewing. This is uh, John Caulfield from Building Design and Construction. Have a good day.